हेलो वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर अनुरेखा चारी वाघ असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ सोशोलॉजी सावित्रीबा फुले पुणे यूनिवर्सिटी आई एम कोऑर्डिनेटिंग द पेपर ऑन सोशोलॉजी ऑफ जेंडर टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अ मॉड्यूल ऑन जेंडर एंड कास्ट इन दिस मॉड्यूल वी विल डिस्कस अबाउट हाउ कास्ट एंड जेंडर इंटरसेक्स विथ वन एन अदर इन ऑर्डर टू क्रिएट डिफरेंट एक्सपीरियंसिस ऑफ इन इक्वालिटी अमॉन्ग वुमेन एंड मैन एन इंडिया using this whole argument in terms of standpoint feminism and drawing also from the whole idea about can dalit women have a different standpoint we discuss this whole module we also draw upon the anti caste non brahmin movement to understand more the idea about how gender and caste interlinks with one another we will also be discussing on dalit feminism but as there is already an another module on dalit feminism we won't go into the detail but surely look into the whole idea about how dalit feminism understands intersectionality and through it understand how gender and caste are related with one another caste and gender since the earlier studies on caste the practice of untouchability and the ideologies which uphold it namely that of purity and pollution has sustained the attention of social science scholars it is now accepted that the reproduction of caste completely depends upon the control and regulation of women's sexuality through the rules of endogamy despite the fact that gender is internal to the social organization of caste studies of caste have largely been done in a male centric terms neglecting the question of gender relations within it However since the 1990s onwards there has been an increasing feminist articulation that caste and gender based hierarchies are twin systems of oppression which cannot be understood independently of each other this has led to a renewed interest in understanding the intersections of gender and caste as they influence and shape social realities this module aims to explore some of the ways in which caste and gender issues in india are intertwined The first section seeks to provide a theoretical understanding developed by various activists and thinkers on the gendered aspects of the caste system. The second section discusses that aspect of violence as it affects a Dalit woman who is the site of intersection of caste, class and gender inequality. Certain important cases will be discussed in order to understand this phenomena. What will the students learn from this module? Firstly, they will examine how gender and caste are interlinked. Secondly, they will learn how gender and caste intersect with other axes such as class and sexuality in order to shape reality. Lastly, they will also be able to analyze how sexual violence affects women within a caste-based system. Section 1: Gender and Anti-Caste Movement. Some of the earliest systematic critiques of the caste system came from Jyotirao Phule and Savitribai Phule in the late 19th century in Maharashtra. closely followed by E V Ramaswamy Nayakar Periyar who led the non brahmin movement in Tamil Nadu in the early 20th century Phule founded the Satya Shodhak Samaj in 1873 which addressed the issues of the working class and equal division of labor between women of different caste and importantly the exploitation of the lower caste at the hand of the brahmin caste For Phule the question of caste and dharma was central to his thinking and he equated brahmanism with hinduism arguing that hindu scriptures such as vedas and smritis were created by brahmins in order to rationalize and perpetuate their dominance he had a dichotomous view of indian society which he believed was formed by two opposing groups the brahmins and the shudra ati shudra part of his politics against brahmanism involved the recognition of gender oppression and his works to liberate women according to manasmriti all women irrespective of varna had the same social position of the shudra based on this phule included all women in his notion of shudra ati shudra although he did not purport a theory of gender inequality or patriarchy per se he believed that women challenging brahmanical orthodoxy and oppression similar to the way shudras challenging brahmanism his recognitions of women's inferior position in society led him to spearhead the movement for women's education At a time when Hindu patriarchal mores mandated that husbands look upon their wives mainly as slaves, Jyoti Ba Phule taught his wife Savitri Ba Phule to read and write and encouraged her to become a teacher. And his partner in his drive to educate women and Dalit, thus exemplifying the feminist position of the personal being political. Their efforts enabled Mukta Bai Salve, a young Dalit girl who at the tender age of 13 wrote a brief essay critiquing the role of caste and the Brahmanical ideologies it carried. 
her essay published in 1855 is significant as it is the earliest available writing by a dalit girl she wrote let that religion where only one person is privileged and the rest deprived perish from the earth and let it never enter our minds to be proud of such a religion Rege argues that Fuller's project for emancipation of the lower caste Dalits and women from the slavery of Brahmanism stands out from the other narratives of caste in that period because it recognizes the ways in which caste patriarchy exploits women of different caste. Tarabai Shinde, an activist in the Satya Shodak Samaj, in her work Stri Purush Tulana, purports that gender and caste work together to create oppressive conditions for women. Written as a response to an article condoning the sentencing of death of a Brahmin woman who allegedly had an abortion, she argued that men were equally, if not more, guilty of the same vices which they accused women of. The text not only attacked Brahminical patriarchy but also patriarchies among the Kunbi and the other non-Brahmin caste. Her work is particularly significant because while it concerns itself with issues such as widow remarriage and ill treatment of widows which were part of the larger public debates in India at the time she also widened her analysis to include the patriarchal ideologies which permeated Hindu society similarly in Tamil Nadu Periyar founded the self respect movement in 1925 a radical anti caste movement which was active for two decades central to the principles of the movement was a women's question the most important ideas he had advanced was about marriage and family which he identified as a key institution sustaining both patriarchy and caste according to him untouchability as a concept and practice was closely connected with notions of both ideological and actual control of women he stressed on the significance of motherhood in caste society arguing that women were required to become mothers for the reproduction of an unequal social order Furthermore he argued that this inscription of female sexuality within the terms of private property and caste is actualized through the institution of marriage for this reason he started the self respect marriage which enabled women self respecters to speak out boldly against caste and patriarchy by emphasizing inter caste marriages and widow remarriages and deliberately rejecting customary practices and the services of brahmin priests the self respect marriage sought to transform the traditional caste based patriarchal family and replace it with a new egalitarian trans caste family the emphasis on desire and individual choice for selection of partners rather than caste and class and by rendering marriage a social contract which any time can be revoked if the partner so decided challenged the very basis of the caste hindu family During the same period Ambedkar at the heights of Dalit mobilization uh, emphatically declared that the real remedy for breaking caste is intermarriage nothing else will serve as a solvent of caste while the dominant understandings of caste considers notions of purity and pollution as central to the caste system B R Ambedkar suggests that the essence of caste is not purity and pollution but endogamy how is the practice of endogamy maintained in a society how was human sexuality and desire controlled and regulated so that the emergence of caste became possible according to him in order to perpetuate endogamy and thereby caste system four different practices were deployed sati enforced widowhood enforced celibacy and the marriage of child wives with older men and widowers the practice of sati he argued was necessary because if the widow several other problems would be created she may possibly be marry another man from her caste group thereby reducing the chances of other young brides from her caste group yet if she married a man outside her caste she would be breaching strict rules of caste endogamy therefore the practice of sati was considered essential by the community however since sati was rendered illegal other practices also came to be deployed enforced with the hood what well, according to ambedkar was another way of controlling women sexuality practice of tonsure sartorial restrictions dietary restrictions and so on were strictly set in order to make the widow undesirable in certain cases some widowers are forced into celibacy in order to ensure they do not break caste boundaries since enforcing celibacy on men is impractical the caste group may choose a child bride for the widower so that the rules of endogamy are maintained and caste based morality is satisfied section 2 caste patriarchy on a parallel low to ma chakravarti through her historical research into vedic period similarly argued that caste hierarchy and gender hierarchy are the organizing principles of the brahmanical social order her work on brahmanical patriarchy laid the groundwork for scholarly research on gendered nature of caste 
Chakravarti argued that women's sexuality was controlled in order to protect the purity of caste. Thus, women were regarded as gateways and their sexuality is regulated through strict endogamous marriages in order to maintain caste purity and ensure patrilineal succession. This interconnection between caste and gender, termed as Brahmanical patriarchy, is a set of rules and institutions in which caste and gender are interlinked, each shaping the other, where the women are crucial in maintaining the boundaries between caste. Further, she argued that this control of sexuality was exercised in two ways, through the spreading of an ideology of consent and through coercive methods. In the first case, the ideology of Sri Dharma or Prativata, feminine ideals of chastity and fidelity to husband was internalized by women who thereby participated in the regulation of their own sexuality. In cases where women broke these ideological norms, patriarchal laws and customs were in place which gave her natal family or conjugal family the power to regulate her impulses. Lastly, in cases where the family fails to control women's choices, the king or the authority could ultimately wield his power to control their sexuality. Prem Chaudhary's research on the policing of marriage practices in Haryana in patriarchal terms reveal a continuity of the regulatory mechanisms described by Chakravarti. Chaudhary argues that kinship and caste are structurally linked at the site of marriage, where kinship ties formed through marriage provide a caste group strength, status and power. Hence, any violation of caste practices affects not only the immediate family involved, but also their entire caste group. This, according to Chaudhary, is the reason behind the strict enforcement of caste and sexual codes. Standing at the center of these codes is the female whose sexuality needs to be channelized into legitimate motherhood in order to maintain the caste patriarchal concern with caste purity, status and power. Any infringement, therefore, prescribed codes could result in violent responses. Taking the case of common honor killings in the north, Chaudhary argues how intercaste marriages result in violence by the male family members on the couple in general and the woman in particular. This is caused by the notion of izzat or honor and one of the most valued ideals in Hindu patriarchal families. It is measured by the degree of respect given by others. While honor may be gained or lost by the proper inappropriate behaviors of the members of a family, it is the behavior of women which is the most critical. Any transgression of the caste and sexual codes on the part of the woman brings dishonor to not only the family but that of the caste group. At the same time, this notion of honor is understood as resting only with the upper caste given that the lower caste women are considered to be sexually promiscuous. They have no purity or honor to maintain. The sexual exploitation and rape of lower caste women by upper caste men, which is rampant given their economic dependence on upper caste land holding men, is often ignored by the community at large. The control of female sexuality is also essential in order to maintain the power hierarchies within the family, wherein the authority rests with the senior males and at times the senior females. When a woman breaks these codes and selects her own partner, she is undermining their power by bestowing her invaluable reproductive and labor potential on the basis of her own choice. This also reveals why senior females in the household are complicit in the violence dealt to the couple in cases of transgressions. Some argue that Dalit women are less oppressed than their upper caste counterparts as they do not carry the burden of Pativata ideology and do not need to worship the husband. Since courts of honor, respect and shame are stronger for upper caste women, they have more pressure to maintain silence about the experiences of their oppression than Dalit women do. However, Dalit women argue they are at the receiving end of both Brahminical patriarchy wherein they are oppressed by the upper caste men and women and also Dalit patriarchy where their own husbands and families exploit their productive and reproductive labor. Through autobiographies and personal testimonies, Dalit women presented their own interpretations of society, their views on the inherent patriarchies within institutions and practices which govern their lives, making Dalit autobiographies a vital aspect of Dalit movement. Guru points out how within Dalit movements, Dalit leaders have always subordinated and suppressed any independent political expression of Dalit women. This exclusion is not limited to the political sphere but also extends to the cultural sphere as Dalit women have been met with criticism from Dalit male writers who do not take Dalit women's writing seriously. Section 3 Gender, Caste and Labor There has been an increasing recognition within feminist scholarship that Dalit women face gender, caste, class oppression in all spheres of their life including that of labor. While class-based inequalities may be explained by using labor theories of value 
in a caste based society public labor also come to represent stigma and humiliation this is because the status of a person is in such a society is intrinsically linked to the nature of work which he or she does one of the features of the caste system is that it is occupation based while intellectual labor was performed by upper caste while lower caste were marked by the nature of their work manual labor according to anandi's research in the tamil nadu village it was found that in order to break away from caste oppression many young dalit men began to withdraw from agricultural work instead looking for non agricultural work outside their villages stemming from their heightened consciousness on the nature of their work and the lower caste status Mary John argues that if there is a distinctive quality to the stigma attached to male dalit labor this quality attains a new register when the laboring body is that of a dalit woman similarly meena gopal points out that it is the very nature of work that she performs that signifies a dalit woman as low inferior and stigmatized some of the examples of labor that lower caste women perform may include manual scavenging agricultural work midwifery and paid domestic work while paid domestic work although marks us as inferior it is still considered more respectable than forms of paid labor that are associated with public manual work this is because this nature of work also marks a lower caste working body as sexually available to men of all castes maitri das studying patterns of women's labor participation by caste and education found that participation was highest among dalit adivasi women with no education on one hand and upper caste women with higher education on the other this complete lack of participation by the middle level women in between who have some form of primary education reveals that these women opt out of the workforce in order to distinguish themselves from the lower caste women who have no choice but to work gender caste and violence section 4 protest awareness campaigns and debates about violence against women have been central to the women's movement in india including sexual violence in which women face both in private and public spheres if women across different social locations caste class religion and so on face sexual violence can sexual violence against dalit women be read in the same manner as sexual violence against any other women in india does caste have a role to play in sexual violence violence against women in india in general is deeply rooted in a patriarchal system which intersects with other axes of inequality such as class religion and caste Violence against Dalit women in particular is complicated by the location of Dalit women at the bottom of caste, class and gender hierarchies. Their location at the site of intersection between these three systems of inequality combined with the dominant discourses on sexual availability of Dalit women and the loose character renders them more vulnerable to violence than other women. The following section will look at few cases of caste based sexual violence in order to understand caste question and the women's question are interlinked. Bhavri Devi case Bhavri Devi who hail from Bathari village of Rajasthan used to work as a sathin for the Rajasthan government's women development project in 1992 she was gang raped by a caste man of the village while her husband was beaten unconscious as punishment for preventing a child marriage of one year old in the gujar family she was from the kumbhar community which is enlisted as a lower caste and backward class community The perpetrators belong to the Gujar dominant wielding economic and political caste and the Brahmin caste. The Khelanji case. The Khelanji case remains one of the most brutal cases of caste atrocities documented. On September 29, 2006, in a village of Khelanji, four members of the Bhutmange family were brutally killed. Sureka Bhutmange and her daughter Priyanka were stripped naked and gang raped publicly before being beaten to death. while her two sons roshan and sudhir were mutilated and beaten to death by the dominant caste hindus of the village the violence was the result of a long standing land dispute combined with increasing upward mobility of dalit family both economically as land owners since traditionally dalits never owned land and culturally in terms of educational achievement of the children are these cases examples of violence against women or these caste based atrocities caste is reproduced through the regulation of sexuality and kinship and vice versa rao argues that sexual relationships within and between caste communities are the nodal point through which caste supremacy is reproduced or challenged within a caste system not all men can view women as potential sexual or marital partners dalit men are strictly barred from any relations with women above their caste while upper caste men can marry women from the lower caste they also came the right to sexually enjoy lower caste or dalit women 
Rao argues that if sexual violence necessarily needs to be understood as caste violence because it operates as a right exclusively to upper caste men. In other words, sexual violence against Dalit women reaffirms the position as both Dalit and as Dalit women. While sexual violence serves to reaffirm the position as Dalit women, it simultaneously also reaffirms the position of Dalit men. By demonstrating control and humiliating the women of a particular caste, the act also seeks to reduce or negate the manhood of that caste. The inability of the men of the caste to protect its women is also a marker of its low status. While upper caste masculinity is redefined by the capacity to possess other, the lower caste maleness is castrated by the inability to protect their own women. In the newly formed post-colonial nation, the introduction of democracy, policy of reservation, modern education, urbanization and movement of Dalits into new vocations than transitional ones led to a change in relations among caste groups. While this resulted in relative economic and cultural upliftment of historically downtrodden caste, it also led to a reinforcement of Dalit and upper caste patriarchies. First, they take our jobs, now a woman is an off-quoted sentiment which is revealing of the exaggerated fears that the dominant caste have about Dalits, whom they fear are taking about both their employment opportunities and luring away their women. While dominant caste reassert their masculinities through violence against Dalit women, Dalit men assert their newly emerging masculinities through sexually violating upper caste women. Here, Anand Teltumdes points out that it is not the traditionally privileged twice born caste that are implicated in caste atrocities, but the slowly ascending social groups, the Shudras, OBCs, and BCs, who are still entrenched in traditional structures that are implicated in such violence. In the case of Bhavri Devi, as a government worker who stepped in to prevent an important traditional event, she was clearly transgressing the boundaries of her caste status, which was defined by passivity and submissiveness. However, by making a public demand, she was also transgressing the gendered public and private distinction and claiming the right to public space, which was traditionally considered a space for men. Rape then is considered the ultimate punishment for these transgressing these norms. The judgment given in the trial court in this case is also revealing of the dominant caste patriarchal ideology. The judgment argues that, that the accused are middle ages and therefore respectable citizens, while teenagers usually commit rape. The judgment goes on to declare, since the accused are upper caste men, the rape could not have taken place because Bhavri was from lower caste. The categories of respectable upper caste male were invoked to construct the binary logic of caste and thereby relegate Bhavri Devi to a position of lower caste and female and therefore non-respectable. In the case of Khailanji, the violation was the economic and cultural upliftment of Dalit Bhut Mange family. Being a Dalit family, they face extreme discrimination from the village, being denied access to the village, well denied permission to build a pakka house and so on. Sureka Bhutmange was an Ambedkarite woman, courageous, outspoken and giving her best to educate her three children. Her daughter Priyanka had excelled in school, standing first in her school in the class 10 exam. This coupled with the family's legal battle of ownership of the land, which the family won, generated envy and resentment among the villagers, who became apprehensive of this clear breaking of expected behavioral codes. As many fact-finding reports later revealed, the villagers often spoke about the need to put the Dalit family in its proper place. As a result, Surekha and her daughter Priyanka were dragged out of the home, stripped and paraded in public before being raped and murdered. The brothers too were tortured and beaten to death in this public spectacle. Patel states how upper caste men and women dictate the sexuality of Dalit women, decide the morality of Dalit women and regulate their bodies. Upper caste women are equally complicit with their male counterparts in perpetrating sexual violence against lower caste women. According to Gita, dominant caste women have often been complicit in the violence against Dalits because their own sense of self-purity and honor have been carefully constructed against the impurity or sexual immorality of Dalit women. Thus, in the Khailaji incident, women from the dominant Kunbi and color caste were watching and cheering the spectacle of violence as it unfolded. 
while the demand to end violence against women has been central to the feminist articulation there still remains a discrepancy in their recognition of the issues of caste based sexual violence and discrimination as rege points out a caste based analysis of the types of violence against women reveals that dowry deaths and strict violent controls on mobility and sexuality of women are typical practices among dominant upper caste while dalit women face larger threat of rape sexual harassment and physical violence the caste factor then becomes essential to the feminist goal of understanding the ways in which violence is operationalized and a struggle to end it thus the issue of violence which cannot be understood as either a caste issue or a gender issue but one which exists in the intersection of the two therefore if the women's movement seeks to work in the interest of all women it would necessarily have to engage with the ways in which gender interacts with other structural inequalities in order to be successful the final section on dalit feminism examines the ways in which dalit women have claimed a voice for themselves and sought to challenge the politics of mainstream women's movement in india which has in large part neglected the caste question in the struggle against patriarchy dalit feminism section 5 In the 1990s several independent and autonomous assertions of dalit women identities began to emerge in India which included National Federation of Dalit Women All India Dalit Women's Forum According to Gopal Guru these organizations advanced varying non-brahmanical ideological positions which challenged the position of mainstream feminism Guru argues that this difference was essential for understanding the specificity of dalit women subjugation which was affected by both external brahmanical patriarchy which stigmatizes dalit women because of the caste status and internal dalit patriarchy wherein dalit men exploited sexual and economic labor of their women factors similar to the black feminist assertion that the position as a black woman was a unique one whose experiences were negated by both black men and white women brilliantly captured by the title of a black woman leader all women are white and all blacks are men but some of us are brave guru argues that dalit women experiences are largely ignored by mainstream upper caste feminists they are also neglected by dalit male activists for example while the mainstream feminist movement focused widely on the issues of rape and sexual violence against women Dalit women argue that the caste factor was never seriously considered by them resulting in an inadequate understanding of sexual violence against dalit and tribal women they also emphasized upon the patriarchal attitudes faced by the dalit men who largely subordinated excluded them at the political arena and rejected their desires ideas and expressions even in the cultural arenas Rege expanding on his discussion argues that the within the new social movements of 1970s and 80s constituted largely by the dalit rights movement and women's rights movements dalit hood came to be seen largely as male while mainstream women's group began to adopt the view that all women are universally victims homogenizing differences based on social locations thus considering all women as savarna Rege argues that the absence of an analytical framework which would understand caste patriarchy is as intrinsically interlinked is evident when one analyzes the women's movement and struggle against dowry and violence. While left-based women's movement understood dowry as part of the capitalist development of India, autonomous women's group theorized dowry in terms of patriarchal violence within families. However, they failed to examine the role of brahmanization of marriage practices on the institutionalization of dowry practice as ranjana shil points out only after the colonial government recognized the legality of the brahmana marriage over other forms of marriage that non brahman caste began to practice dowry that caste is crucial to the analysis of the dowry question while guru argued the position of difference taken by the dalit women challenged the mainstream feminist movement rege takes a step further by arguing that we need to move from the question of difference of dalit voices to the dalit standpoint Just as black feminists argued that black women possess a unique understanding of reality owing to the social position as a, at the intersection of race, class and gender, Rege argues that a Dalit feminist standpoint is more emancipatory than other positions because it emphasizes upon individual experiences within socially constructed groups and focuses on the hierarchical multiple changing structural power relations of caste class ethnic which construct a group in this module on gender and caste we discussed about the concept of caste and gender and how they intersect with one another and create a different kind of experiences of inequality among people in india 
using the standpoint feminism. We also talked about Dalit feminism. We discussed about anti-caste and non-Brahmin movements. So therefore, now as students of sociology, now we have got a complex understanding of the working of caste and gender and also understand how power and inequality have operated in the fields of caste and gender. Using this whole idea in terms of heteropatriarchal caste structures, we will also understood about how patriarchies are not singular, unitary, but multiple patriarchies intersecting with one another to create different kinds of inequalities which women and men in India have to traverse. Thank you.